He specializes in organic fruit and vegetable gardening. Today's workshop, Fall Vegetable Gardening, will cover what to plant and when, as well as other topics, but in San Francisco's unique microclimate, what to plant and when. Thank you for joining us today, and let's give a digital welcome to Jonathan Prop. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, you need to unmute Jonathan. Okay. There um, you go. There you hello, go. everyone. I'm Jonathan Prop. I'm a master gardener uh, down here in Menlo Park in in balmy southern San Mateo County. I've been a master gardener since 2008, and I specialize in organic fruit and vegetable gardening. Um, I was just checking on the chat to see whether all the people in the class were from San Francisco, as I've sort of targeted the presentation at San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> I see we have someone from San Jose, which is certainly within range. Everything should apply. Uh, we do have someone from Portland. I'm assuming that's Oregon. and you're oh wow okay san luis obispo county okay um and one in portland oregon now portland your fall and winter weather is going to be a little bit different um and and you know i can touch on that as we go along okay so we'll take about an hour here to go through the presentation as Ramon said, you'll all be getting a copy of the presentation afterward. Uh, we'll then break for questions. Ariti will be collecting all the questions and we'll do, depending on how many questions there are, we'll do you know roughly a half an hour of, of questions. All right, so let's get started. Here's our agenda today uh, for a little, uh, we'll just focus on microclimates a little bit. It's a little bit nerdy. Um, but uh, I am known as the weather nerd of the local master gardeners. And I think it's important to understand uh, our climate here so that you understand what's going on in the fall and the winter and why we're in a bit of a unique situation here compared to some other parts of the country. The main focus will be on planting. I'm sure that's what most of you are interested in. What should I be planting now? How do I plant it, et cetera? And then we're going to spend a fair bit on soil care because soil care is really critical to growing healthy vegetables. We'll uh, cover crop rotation, cover cropping, and then just a brief bit on, on pest management. Um, and there are some resources in the chat window um, UC ANR, which is University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. That's the parent organization of the Master Gardeners. They have a wealth of information there for the home gardener. Um, and um, also the website of our organization, the San Francisco San Mateo County Master Gardeners, we have a wealth of information up there as well. So let's get started. Let's talk climate. So th this is a map of world ocean currents, okay? Um, red is warm currents. So you've all heard of the Gulf Stream along the East Coast. Um, blue is cold. And you'll notice that California has um, a cold ocean current. Um, if you're at all crazy like my brother and sister-in-law who swim in the bay and swim in the Pacific Ocean, um, you know that the water temperature rarely gets out of the 50s off our coast. And it's because it's coming down straight from Alaska. And that in fact is what makes our marine ecosystem so rich and, and plentiful off the, off the coast. It's that cold water, supporting all the all the microorganisms in in the ocean. Now, that is sort of that is basically the main influence on our climate and I'll explain why that is. 
If you look for other cold currents in the world, you'll notice there's one on the west coast of South America coming up from Antarctica, right? Alongside Chile and Peru. There's one on the southwest coast of Africa going up along um, South Africa here. And there's one along the west coast of Australia as well coming out of Antarctica. Now, what's notable about that is those are all parts of the world that have very similar climates to the climate that we have, okay, which is um, generally mild winters, uh, mild wet winters, and warm dry summers. And if you're planting things in our area, it's also worth noting that plants native to those parts of the world are going to do really well here. So a lot of Australian native plants, a lot of South African native plants grow really well in California, um, as well as Mediterranean plants. And of course, our climate is called a Mediterranean climate because that area is known for its mild wet winters and hot dry summers. That cold ocean current provides what we like to call nature's air conditioning. And this is what's responsible for our very temperate climate here in, in the summertime. And, and as we've all been watching the news and reading the headlines about the rest of the world and the rest of the country absolutely roasting this summer, we've had very pleasant summer weather. And that's because we get nature's air conditioning from this cold ocean current. This is actually a satellite photo um, taken by the National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and for, it's from a weather satellite. And what you're seeing is the fog bank just pushed right up against the California coast on a very typical summer day. And here's Monterey Bay in here. And here is the San Francisco Bay Area in here, which are two places where the fog loves to drive in. Now, what causes this? Well, the, the ocean currents are very cold. The water temperature is in the 50s. And in the summertime, it gets really hot inland. So here's the Central Valley. The temperature gets up in the 90s and the 100s. And what happens is that cold air wants to go and displace the hot air. So it wants to go that way. And so that that cold ocean air is 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 dri is driven inland. And you know, we tend to call it fog um and it certainly looks that way when you're standing at the Golden Gate and it's blasting through. In in reality, it's 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 cold, cold marine air um, that's condensing. And what really happens is it settles in as a layer of low clouds. It rushes in in the afternoon, sits there overnight, and then burns off the next morning. And only rarely does it, does it actually show itself as fog along the coast. And that's our nature's air conditioning. If you drive down the peninsula, uh, late on a summer's day, you'll see that blanket of marine air going up and over the mountains and, and down. And, and this is what causes that. This is uh, a hand-drawn topographic map of the Santa Cruz Mountains. This comes from the book Golden Gate Gardening by Pam Pierce. Uh, Pam used to be the San Francisco Chronicle Garden critic many years ago. And if you are a gardener in San Francisco, Golden Gate Gardening is still the standard for what you can grow and how you grow things in, in San Francisco. Now, to explain this, we're looking from the west at the Santa Cruz Mountains. 
T is Mount Tam up here. Um, M is, um, not sure what M is. G is the Golden Gate. Okay, it's the only pure gap in, in the mountain range. This is the San Bruno Gap. This is the Crystal Springs Gap where Highway 92 goes over to Half Moon Bay. And then this is Mount Loma Prieta um, south of Highway 17. So what happens is the cold air wants to go blasting through here to the Central Valley, but it's blocked. And so it's going to go in those places where it can, which is why the Golden Gate is always so windy and cold on a typical summer afternoon. And if you've, if for those people who live in the hills of San Mateo or Belmont, they know those afternoon winds come blasting through the Crystal Springs Gap. And if you'll remember the San Bruno Gap, which is just south of San Bruno Mountain in South San Francisco, um, the city of San Francisco notoriously built a baseball and football stadium named Candlestick Park um, right at the eastern end of the San Bruno Gap, which was a really bad place to put a stadium because it was always cold and windy. The result of this, and this is kind of the point of all this, is that we have these incredible microclimates in the summer because the fog is the, the, or the cold air is hugging the coast, keeping the coast very cold, but it can't necessarily get over the hills. So it's going to blast through the San Francisco Bay here. It's going to filter through the gaps in here, and then it spreads on down through the bay. It spreads up north through San Pablo Bay and makes Napa and Sonoma one of the best wine growing regions in the world. And this is a map again from the National Weather Service on a very typical summer day. We had several days like this this summer and you can see the temperature spread from basically 60 degrees at the coast to over 100 in Dublin, Pleasanton, Livermore, what they call the Tri-Valley area. That's an incredible spread for what's less than 50 miles, okay? And we get all these little microclimates, even within San Francisco, you're going to have 10 or 15 degree difference from the sunset to South of Market and Potrero Valley, right? Um, and then you get a lot of that cool marine air influencing the bay shore here and here. But what's interesting is, is that um, it doesn't filter in to uh, Woodside, Atherton, Portola Valley area, um, which is what we call the banana belt of the peninsula. So if I drive from my home in Menlo Park across town on a summer's afternoon, it'll be 15 degrees warmer on the other side of town. And that's going to influence the, um, our climate. And it's going to allow you to grow much better summer crops, but it's going to give you uh, cooler winters. Now, key point about the fall is that this starts to break down in, in the fall. Um, typically sometime in September, because it's not heating up so much in the Central Valley and our and that that cold marine air, you know, which has been here for foggest and no sky July and June gloom and May gray is starting to break down. And so what that means is that fall is actually the warmest time of the year in this area. And statistically, the warmest day of the year in San Francisco is October 2nd. Okay. So while the rest of the country worries about July and August, we have very mild, sometimes if you're in San Francisco, downright cold July and August, and October is our warm season. 
So that's something you need to bear in mind as, as you think about fall gardening. So if your garden is like my garden, it kind of looks like this right now. It's just, you know, completely overgrown. There's tomatoes and basil and stuff like that. And it's kind of hard to think about fall planting at this point um, because your summer crops are still in there. The temperature's warming up and they could be in there another couple of months. But the reality is that this is the time you need to make some decisions. It's actually a little bit late to be planting a fall garden. If, you, if you're going to be harvesting in the fall, you want to be planting in August, September. And we're, you know, we're really at the tail end of that. Um, October is really your time for planting winter crops and cover crops. And we'll cover both of those things. Now, the reason for that is that even though the temperature is warming up, we're losing our daylight. Okay. And so your, your growing season during the day is shortening. So what that means is if you have raised beds, and many of us do have raised beds or, you know, just specific areas where we do our gardening, you're going to have to make some choices. If you're going to plant a fall crop or a winter crop or a cover crop, that means pulling out your summer crops now, much as we all hate to do that, right? Um, the good news is that you can harvest all those green tomatoes and put them on the counter and they'll ripen eventually. Um, but this is the time to make choices. Do I want to plant a fall crop, which means I'm probably not going to have a winter crop? Or do I want to plant a winter crop? Or do I want to plant a cover crop and not grow anything edible at all? And we'll talk about why you might want to do all those different things. So here's here's our planted calendar. Um, so we have, if you go to the website of the San Francisco San Mateo County Master Gardeners, we have planting calendars. They were created by Carol O'Donnell, uh, Carol O'Donnell, one of our most master gardeners. And it tells you by month what you can plant either as seeds, S, or as transplants, T. And we have three varieties. Because of our microclimates, we need to have three different planting calendars. We have one for the foggy areas of San Francisco and San Mateo County. So if you're in San Francisco, that would be pretty much everything from Twin Peaks West, okay? Sunset, Marina, Presidio, um, et, et cetera. Certainly Daly City, um, Pacifica, all the way down the coast, Half Moon Bay, et cetera. Those are going to be what we call foggy. Then we have one called hot, and I put that in air quotes because it doesn't get all that hot here compared to the rest of the country. Hot would be Southern San Mateo County, basically Redwood City on South. Okay. But again, that's going to vary based on proximity to the bay. Doesn't get all that hot close to the bay in Redwood City, Menlo Park, etc. Does get much warmer on the west side uh, of Redwood City, Menlo Park, etc., and on into Woodside. Th that, those are hot areas. Sunny is sort of everything in between. So think. San Mateo, San Carlos, um, all pretty much everything, say, from Redwood City up to kind of uh, Millbrae, South San Francisco. Now, again, things are going to vary depending on where you are. If you're up in the hills, you get cold afternoon winds, you know, that's not going to be terribly sunny, right? If you're down in the flats, not too close to the bay, that's going to be more sunny. So as I said, we get a lot of variation here. And that's why, you know, when I'm answering questions for people about plants, 
first question I ask them is like, where do you live? Okay. Um, all right. So let's focus in on September, October here in terms of planting. Basically, at this point, there's sort of three categories of things you can plant. Um, you can plant any of the leafy greens, okay, because they're going to grow just fine through the winter. Um, most of them are going to germinate pretty quickly. The one exception probably is Swiss chard. It's starting to get a little late to plant Swiss chard, so you might want to plant that from seedlings rather than from seed. Um, any of the root crops can be planted now. They'll grow just fine over the winter. So that includes um, carrots and um, uh, kohlrabi, parsnips, radishes, turnips, etc. cetera. Um, and the root crops you always want to plant from seed, okay? The, they don't transplant well at all. Um, so Great to plant the root crops now. They'll grow throughout the winter. You'll harvest them in, in the spring. Um, this is a great time of year to plant onions and garlic. If you like growing onions and garlic, um, you plant them now. They overwinter, they shoot up in the spring, and then around May you harvest. And then you're ready to put in your, your summer crops. Um, then the last category are the uh, cruciferous vegetables, which are broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage. It's a little late to plant those from seed. Right now, they take much longer to um, uh, much much longer to grow than your leafy greens. So if you are planting Brussels, you know any of those uh, cruciferous vegetables, you'll want to plant them from transplants at this point, okay? And again, they're going to overwinter just fine, um, but you're not going to see much in the way of results until the spring, okay? So that's what to plant and when, you, as I said, everyone will get a copy of this presentation so you can look at this in more detail. We can also address questions later on. So winter gardening, um, you know, the one thing you can't grow during the winter is any of the warm season vegetables. So, you know, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, squash, um, cucumbers, you know, that stuff just needs more daylight, more heat. OK, but other than that, the things I mentioned, the cruciferous vegetables, the green leafy vegetables, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention, you can grow peas just fine. You can grow fava beans just fine. Um, they'll just grow through the winter. And 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 why is that? It's because we almost never get a freeze in this area. And again, that's due to that ocean current off our coast. And because the San Francisco Peninsula is sticking right out into the middle of the ocean in the bay, um, you know, when all the water temperatures in the 50s, it's pretty hard for the air temperature to get down below 32. So you'll almost you almost never see a freeze in San Francisco, and you'll rarely see a frost there. Um, along the bay, it's pretty much about the same. It's pretty rare for you, for there to be a freeze on the bay side of the peninsula or the ocean side of the peninsula. Now, as I mentioned, the places that are a little further inland, um, you know, at the sort of foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains and away from the bay, they're going to be hotter in the summer and colder in the winter because they're further away from the water. And you are, it's more possible that you'll get a, a frost or a freeze. In, in those areas. Again, pretty rare on the freezes, but frosts for sure. So because of that, you can grow your vegetables over the winter just fine. The problem is not temperature. The problem is sunlight, okay? You know, it, those, your vegetables need at least six hours of sunlight a day. Your summer crops like tomatoes, they need a good eight plus. Per day. 
Um, but your leafy greens are fine with six a day. But it's it's hard for them to get that much sunlight. And the reason for that, it's not the length of the day, it's the angle of the sun. Okay, so this may be a little bit nerdy, but just bear with me. This shows the sun angle throughout the year at 40 degrees north latitude. We're we're a little lower than that. We're 38 something. And so at the vernal and autumn, autumnal equinox, so that's the spring and fall equinox or March and September 21st, the sun rises due east, doesn't go straight up overhead, okay? It goes out to the south at an angle, okay? And then, and that's about uh, 40 something degree, about 47 degrees above the horizon. So think about that, you know, think of a 45 degree angle. Um, you can even measure this on your iPhone. Um, you know, think of a 45 degree angle from the horizon. It, it's not as high as you think it is, right? And then it's going to go from there and set due west. Now, in the summertime, the sun's going to rise in the northeast, and it's going to rise. It's going to go just south of of straight up. It's it's at like seventy six percent degrees above the horizon, so it's almost straight up. And then it's going to do this wide arc and set in the northwest. So it does this wide arc around the sky, which is why you get so many more daylight hours um, and sunlight hours. At the winter solstice, which is December 21st, the sun rises in the southeast, only goes up to 23 degrees above the horizon, and then sets in the southwest. So, you know, just sort of try to envision that at some point. And what and so what you'll see is the sun is really low in the winter, which means it's going to get blocked. It's going to get blocked by trees and fences and houses and apartment buildings, etc. And so it's not so much that the days have less sunlight. It's just so much less sunlight is going to get through to your vegetables. And that's why they're just not going to grow very much. Um, you, you know, Carol O'Donnell is fond of saying, what you'll get is sort of a nice refrigerator in your vegetable bed. You know, everything will grow and it won't die, but it's just going to sit there. It's just not going to grow very much. And then you'll notice, you know, depending on where you live and how much the sun gets blocked. Uh, for me, it's kind of around February. Um, all of a sudden, you know, the plants are going to start growing again. So what can you, what'll grow through the winter? Well, all the lettuce and greens, Swiss chard, kale is a great winter crop. Uh, all your root crops and peas will grow very slowly. Okay. Um, Many of your herbs will um, will grow through the winter just fine. Um, really, the only herbs that you're going to have to replant in the spring are basil, which is an annual. Uh, parsley and cilantro are annuals. Um, but a lot of the uh, Mediterranean herbs, which do very well here, like um, sage, lavender, rosemary, um, et cetera, um, they'll do just fine. Now, what you'll want to do in the winter is you want to cut those back to the, they're all, they all get these woody stems, cut those woody stems back. You can cut them back pretty much to the ground. Um, and they'll just grow right back, um, in, in the next spring. Um, peppers will do fine. You know, they are biennials. So, um, they won't tolerate a freeze, but barring that, they'll they'll come back. Uh, rhubarb and asparagus actually prefer a freeze. Um, and of course, they disappear um, late in the fall below the ground and then emerge the next spring. 
So as I mentioned, um, most herbs are perennial. So all the woody, um, all the woody herbs, I think this is uh, culinary sage here. You cut way back to the to these woody stems here, cut off all the green growth on them, and they'll come back in great form next spring. Um, your more delicate leafy perennial herbs like tarragon, sorrel, um, just leave them. They're not going to die, but you don't want to cut them back. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about whether to plant from seeds or um, seedlings. So as I mentioned, your root crops do not transplant well. So all your root crops, you really want to direct sow in the soil. Um, your cruciferous vegetables, on the other hand, um, do much better uh, starting, because they take a long time to germinate, long time to grow, um, they're best off started inside and then transplanting outside, okay? And that includes the cruciferous vegetables and then tomatoes and eggplants, which are of course a summer crop. And then all the stuff in the middle, you can do either one. Um, the leafy greens, you can transplant, but they generally germinate so quickly and they, they're they very shallow rooted. So sometimes they can be hard to transplant. Um, so I find them a little easier to plant uh, by seed, certainly cheaper. Um, beans and squash and cucumbers and peas are just dead easy um, to plant in the soil because they're such big seeds. Um, but you can absolutely uh, transplant them if you want. So do you do seeds or seedlings? Well, um, you know, seeds are cheaper. Um, you know, you'll pay basically the same amount for a packet of seeds as you will for a six pack of vegetables at the nursery. And of course you're gonna get more than six plants from a packet of seedlings. So they're cheaper. Um, you, there are many more varieties available via seed. Um, you know, the, the garden stores are gonna carry the popular varieties, but if there are certain varieties that you like, um, that are hard to find in the garden store, then you, you've got to start them yourself. So there are, you know, certain things I grow, certain cucumbers, beans, et cetera, that I like that are very hard to find in the garden store. So I just grow them from seed. Now, the problem with seeds is that it just requires more advanced planning uh, because if you go to the garden store and grab a seedling there, that thing was started six to eight weeks ago. So if you're planting from seed, you should, you gotta be thinking eight weeks ahead all the time. So it's like when you're harvesting one crop in your vegetable bed, it's probably time to plant the next crop. And that's the way you need to start thinking with seeds. So it just requires more advanced planning. Um, seedlings, obviously, you can be impulsive and say, hey, I want to plant Swiss chard today and just run down to the store and get them. Now, if you do get seedlings, I just want to you know, point this out to people. There's always that temptation to get the biggest one because you think you're getting more plant. But you need to bear in mind that with a vegetable, the root is going to be roughly a third to half the length of the stem. So if you look at this tomato here, half the stem is from here to here. So the stem has probably already hit the bottom of this pot. And what happens then is the roots start to curl in on themselves. And when you transplant it, it's not going to establish itself very well. So you actually want to choose things that are, you know, much better sized for the pot that they're in. 
And then the other thing I would say is always look for a good dark green color. Light green is, is a sign that that plant has used up all the nutrients in the soil, whereas dark green is a much healthier looking vegetable. So let's talk about soil care because soil care is, is absolutely critical to growing vegetables. Um, in, in uh, you know, I would say soil care is 90% of success or lack of success with growing vegetables. So you have to understand that soil is an ecosystem. There are billions of microorganisms and small organisms living in the soil at any one time. And in fact, the uh, those microorganisms are interacting with the roots of trees and the roots of your vegetables. They are taking nutrients from the soil, nitrogen, carbon, etc., and feeding them to the vegetables. Okay. Um, so, and of course the water is in the soil and the plant is pulling the water from the soil. So a couple of things, feed your soil, not your plants. That's sort of a mantra we say in the master gardeners. Okay. Never think about feeding your plants, feed your soil. And then the soil and the microorganisms feed your plant. Okay. So avoid any chemical pest and weed control, chemical fertilizers. Um, always try to have something in the ground at all times. Bare soil um, loses its uh, structure um, over time. Um, avoid walking on the soil because it compresses, compacts the soil, makes it harder to absorb water and pushes the air out of the soil, okay? Um, so this is um, what soil is made of. So you might be surprised to learn that soil is about 25% air. And that's why I say don't compact the soil, okay? There needs to be air in there. And it's about 25% water as well. And of course, that air provides space for the water to, to infiltrate in there. Um, much of the soil is the minerals, the, the sand, silt, and clay that have been, you know, breaking down for eons, okay? And then a small percentage of it is organic matter. So that's the decomposition of plants and um, and, and basically of plants. Um, and it's that organic matter that helps create a good soil structure and that provides nutrients in, in the soil, okay? Um, so I said before, feed the soil, not the plants. Um, and so that organic matter as it breaks down um, into its component nutrients are picked up by the microorganisms and fed to the plants, okay? And so you can see the contrast of that between organic fertilizers, which go through this cycle, and then the synthetic fertilizers, the master grows of, of the world, um, which are just going straight to the plant. Um, and they're not building that healthy soil. Now, how do you maintain that soil and the organic matter in the soil? Add plenty of compost. Uh, fall is a great time to do that. We'll talk about that in a second. But when you pull out those summer crops, a good two to three inches of a good compost laid directly on top of the soil. You can, you know, turn it into the first few inches of the soil if you want. Um, and you should always at all times have some sort of a cover, what we call mulch on the soil. And that serves a number of purposes. It helps keep the soil cooler in summer, warmer in winter. Um, it 
maintains moisture in the soil, prevents it from evaporating out in the summertime. Um, and it also cushions um, the soil from hard rains. And use cover crops, we'll discuss those as a way to add nutrients to the soil and do what we call chop and drop. Um, and we'll, I'll explain what that is. So uh, benefits of adding compost, you can see increases organic matter, which leads to more microorganisms, improves the water holding capacity of, of the soil and the soil structure. So when you pull out your summer crops, uh, you need to think about nutrient requirements in your soil. And it depends on what you've been growing. So if you've been growing sort of the classic summer vegetables, tomatoes, cucumber, squash, peppers, basil, et cetera, they're what we call heavy feeders. They extract a lot of nutrients, particularly nitrogen from the soil, and they will likely have depleted your soil through the summer. So that means you will need to add some nutrients back into the soil. Now, these are what we call light feeders. So if you've been growing those, they're not taking nearly as much in the way of nutrients from the soil. And then this category we call soil neutrals because the legumes, which are the beans and the peas, they actually add nitrogen into the soil while they're growing. And then when the pods form with the, the seeds inside of them, then they start extracting the nitrogen from the soil. If you pull out a bean plant, um, you'll notice little white nodules on the roots, and those are nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So beans and peas add nitrogen to the soil, but then as soon as they start going to seed, which is when you get beans and peas, um, then they extract nitrogen from the soil. So it, they're kind of net neutral there. So the point is, if you've been growing plants that are heavy feeders through the summer, you are going to need to think about adding nutrients into your soil. You're not gonna do that with compost alone. You will need to add some form of an organic fertilizer um, to do that, okay? so. The fall is a great time to take out your, um, your old crops, uh, add compost, add organic fertilizer if, if you want and need to, till it in the soil, water it, let it sit for a week, and then you can do your planting. Um, you can do a similar cycle in the spring as well if you want, but fall is really the best time to do it. Now, crop rotation, just a point about crop rotation, you want to try to avoid planting crops of the same family in the same place year after year. Um, and the reason is that you can build up soil-borne diseases, and this is a very bad soil-borne disease called verticillium wilt or fusarium wilt, um, which will kill your tomato plants. And so when I say families, these are the families. So we've been talking about cruciferous vegetables here. Um, we've talked about legumes here. Um, we're much of, many of us are familiar with the cucurbits, which are cucumbers and melons and squash. Um, but another one to uh, be aware of is the nightshade family. And that's these very popular plants of eggplant, tomato, pepper, and potato. So the point is you don't want to um, continually grow the same family in the same location. You want to try to rotate things around if you can. Now, some of us don't have that luxury, um, but if you have the ability, um, you should do so. So here's what you want to do in the fall. Remove your old plants, compost them. They'll, they'll, it, they'll be great compost. If you have a compost pile, uh, you can or donate them to Recology's compost pile. 
just make sure you don't compost any diseased plants, okay? Because um, the compost needs to be really, really hot to kill the microbes in there. Um, and they might do that in Recology's compost, but they won't do that in your backyard compost. Um, add a good two to three inches of organic compost to improve the texture um, and add some organic fertilizer if you need to add nutrients into the soil. Now, an alternative to, to doing that is cover cropping. Um, so cover cropping is growing crops that will return nutrients to the soil. And we cover crop in the winter, generally, um, and we do it in beds where you had heavy feeders over the summer. So in addition to returning nitrogen to the soil, as I've talked about here, um, and most people are gonna do fava beans to do that. Um, in addition to adding new nitrogen to the soil, just the fact of having those root structures in your bed over the winter um, are going to improve the soil structure, maintain a good soil structure in the winter, prevent it from getting compacted down by the rains, etc. Um, so um, people tend to do a mix of fava beans, which are going to you know, grow quite tall with um, some lower crops such as crimson clover, vetch, oats, um, buckwheat, etc. And you can sort of intersperse those because they're lower and the fava beans are higher. Now, if you're going to cover crop, October is the time to plant because you want them to get established before the days get really short. Um, and so what I find is my fava beans get up to like a foot high and then it hits November and they just stop. And then in February, the sunlight hits it again and they grow taller and taller and they'll grow, you know, several feet tall. Now, here's the key thing. Um, you want to harvest after they flower, but before the seed pods form. And that's because, as I said, once the seed pods form, they're now pulling that nitrogen out of the soil. They're reversing the process from before. So you want to cut them after they flower um, and do what we call chop and drop. Cut, don't pull them out because those roots are maintaining good soil structure. Um, if you cut off the top of the plant, those roots will die and just become more organic matter. So cut them off at the soil level and then just chop them up as small as you can and leave them on top of the soil because that's gonna turn into what we call a green compost and they'll break down and dry out and uh, filter into the soil. So, you know, it, it's interesting. We've been talking about cover crops for years and it just seems like people are picking it up more and more. I was at the garden store yesterday and they were completely out of cover crop seeds. <laughs> so it's it's clearly, you know, people have gotten the message. All right, so just a little bit on pest management and then we'll be done and, and ready to take your questions. Our parent organization, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, um, that's what you see up here, University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources, um, they promote this approach to managing pests. It's called integrated pest management. And the idea is to look at managing pests in a holistic way and use nature to combat nature, I call it, right? Um, everything out there that's a pest has something else out there that wants to eat it. Okay. So, you know, if you can get, you know, a good healthy ecosystem out there in, in your garden, then you're going to have a lot fewer pests. So the first step of, of 
integrated pest management is monitoring, okay? Are your leaves being chewed? Are your tomatoes landing on the ground with bites out of them? Uh, are your beans being chewed off, et cetera, right? Um, so monitoring, okay, something's going on here. And then correct identification of pests, okay? Can you see what's going on? Is it a vertebrate pest, right? A mouse or a rat or a squirrel? Um, you know, you can tell by the way things are being chewed. You can tell by the way leaves are being chewed. Are they being chewed from the outside in or are there little holes in the leaves? This is where our helpline can be really helpful. You can take photos of the problem that you have and send it via email to our Master Gardener helpline and we will help you identify that pest. In addition, you can go to this IPM website. They have tons of photos. You can search by plant or you can search by pest um, and you can help identify the pest your own way. Another great thing is to get yourself a little magnifying glass uh, or a loop, a, a jeweler's loop, which will magnify um, the pest and make it a lot easier um, to tell what you've got. Is it an aphid? Is it a white fly? Is it a beetle, et, et cetera? Now, once you figured out what it is, then, you know, how do you deal with it? So one thing you can do is have habitat manipulation. Um, what does that mean? Well, you, you know, snails and slugs, for example, love to nest in damp, dark places during the day. And then they come out at night and munch your leafy greens. So you want to make sure that you clear out any places that could be good snail and slug uh, uh, habitat close to your vegetables. Similarly, if you've got rats, look around for, you know, sort of dense overgrown places where not, where rats love to nest, okay? Um, another example of habitat manipulation is, um, you know, going out and hand picking. Um, best way to handle snails is to go out at night when it's dark and the snails are out go with a flashlight and you'll find them and you just hand pick them off, off your vegetables. So that's what we mean by habitat manipulation. I will show you some other things that I use that are essentially protective barriers. Okay. That's another form of habitat manipulation. All right. And then you can plant companion flowers to support beneficial insect populations. So we all know that lady beetles um, eat aphids. So if you can maintain a healthy colony of lady beetles in your garden, you'll cut down on your aphid infestations, etc. Now, just a, uh, a few things that I like to use that, you know, not everyone is aware of. Uh, this is what's called a floating row cover. It's a woven fabric. Uh, the brand name is Agrabon. Uh, there are different weights. AG15 is the lighter weight. And in other parts of the country where it gets colder in the winter, people use floating row covers as a way to keep their gardens warmer. And it gives them an extra few weeks of growing season in the spring and the fall. Um, but they're going to use the heavier weights. We don't need that. We don't need the warmth factor. What I'm looking for is the insect barrier and the predator barrier. So by putting a floating row cover, and this is a four by eight bed, and I've got um, number nine steel gauge wire um, bent into hoops um, and, and fastened in the ground. And then I just lay the floating row cover over that and fasten it down at the ends. And now I've got an impermeable barrier um, to most uh, vertebrate and invertebrate pests. Okay. So very effective. Of course, if you're growing something tall, you can't do this, right? You know, th this, this thing is, uh, probably a couple of feet, um, off, 
the level of the soil. So this is for growing leafy greens, particularly good for over leafy greens. Or when things are young and they're seedlings and they may be tempting for birds or insects, uh, you cover them with a floating row cover and that gives them time to get big enough and healthy enough so that they can re resist a little leaf chewing. This is tool. Uh, tool is another uh, synthetic fabric. It's used mostly for um, making dresses and veils and things like that. And um, whereas Agrabon you would buy from a garden supplier, tool you buy from a fabric supplier. And I use tool now to net all my fruit trees. Uh, against uh, squirrels. So this is an apple tree, completely wrapped in tool. It's very easy to work with. You just drape it over and you fasten it together with those little metal binder clips, or you can use clothespins. Um, and it works like a charm. Um, and then the best thing about it is you can take it off and reuse it the next year. Um, so I become a big fan of tool, use it on all my fruit trees. This year for the first time, I used it as an enclosure for my pole beans and for my tomatoes to keep the darn squirrels and other pests out of there. And it worked really well. And then finally, uh, this one's a little bit more extreme and advanced, but um, this is an electric fence that's powered by a couple of D batteries. And when you turn it on, it just sends a very low voltage charge through uh, the metal wires here, uh, which are just enough to give any critters a little shock when they touch it. Not going to kill them, um, but it's going to tell them, you know, you probably shouldn't go here. And um, I have used this against squirrels in the past. Okay, um, that's all I've got. So I will, um, I just wanna go through a few more slides here. Here's the Pam Pierce book. So you got a reference for that. Uh, this is the Master Gardener Handbook, which is available to the general public and is a, is a wealth of information. Um, this is a wonderful book by Jessica Walliser about uh, companion planting called Plant Partners. Uh, here's our website here, lots of resources, videos, etc. cetera. Um, just want to uh, thank the uh, San Francisco Public Library, Ramon, for, um, for hosting us today. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, monthly newsletter. Um, you can donate money to keep us supporting the public. And then here is um, the links for the, uh, the Master Gardener helpline. Uh, here's when you can visit the helpline in person. Here's our website. And that's it. So um, I'll stop sharing here and we can handle questions. Already, I think you're muted. You're muted, RT. So Jonathan, I'd like to thank you for your very thorough and outstanding presentation today. Um, as a master gardener, I learn something every time uh, Jonathan speaks because we all have our areas that we tend to specialize in and vegetables is certainly one of Jonathan's. So many thanks to you, Jonathan and the library for hosting our presentation today. We do have a few questions. However, before I just jump into those, I wanted to call your attention that all of many of the links that uh, Jonathan just reviewed on the resources are also in the rolling chat for signing up for our newsletter, for going on our website, um, and for looking for the Master Gardener website and also for planning your vegetable garden. There's a link for that. If you ever have a plant uh, that you want to identify or that may have a um, disease of some type, 
we have a helpline right in the San Francisco Botanical Garden at the entrance to 9th and Lincoln. And we are open Wednesday. We're in the Helen Russell Library from 1030 to 2 p.m. So we ask that you um, you can let people know that you have a plant or a specimen, but they will ID it right outside in this beautiful little courtyard and try to help you in person. And if you cannot make that time on Wednesday, as Jonathan pointed out, and I'll reiterate, uh, there's also in the chat the telephone number for the helpline and the email for the helpline. So it's a great service that we offer to San Francisco Master Gardeners. So moving on now, we have a, just a few questions here, and I'll look at the chat. You have time. People that are still um, with us today have time to get their questions into the chat, but we'll start with the first three. So one of the questions has to do with expiration date on seed packets. <laughs> Like, how do you view those and what could you share about that, Jonathan? You know, I don't really buy it that much. And, you know, the more I talk to people, the more I read about it. Um, people tend to discount it. Um, I mean, there's one way to find out, right? Um, and that is... You know, the seed packet always says packed for use in 2023, right? Because they want you to toss it out at the end of 2023. Um, there's one way to find out, and that is plant those two-year-old seeds and, and see what happens, right? You know, just, you know, plant your 2022 seeds over here. Plant your 2023 seeds over here. See if you get any difference in germination whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, as a rule of thumb, the bigger the seeds, the longer they're going to last. Um, so bean seeds, um, I would say easily two to three years, you're fine. As long, now this is an important point, as long as they're kept in a cool, dark place. Yes. Any moisture and your seeds are going to start to germinate and, and that's it. But um, I would say a good two to three years for bean seeds. Um, everything else, I will definitely try it, you know, one year in, no problem at all. But again, the best way to do it is just is just to track it and see if, if you have any problems with germinating. Okay. That's a good tip. So in, a, in essence, you're running your own little lab experiment. Well, right. I mean, I'm a big fan of that. I just, I love people who, who do lab experiments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your response. Um, another question has to do with herbs inside. And the question is, are there any herbs that can keep providing, keep producing indoors in the winter? Or will they just not get enough light to do so? Well, again, you know, it it depends on where they are inside and your exposure, right? Because as I talked about, that very low sun angle in the winter um, means, you know, most of your windows are not getting direct sunlight for very long. Okay. Um, so, you, you know, there's only one way to tell, and that is to try it. Right. Um, you know, I will say that if you're looking for things that are sort of the absolute lowest light, uh, lowest warmth, parsley and cilantro are great. Um, cilantro, in fact, hates warm weather and goes it just bolts the minute it gets warm. So cilantro loves cool weather, as does parsley. Um, those are great. You know, something low growing like thyme will be um, great. You know, uh, you could try basil. I, I I don't know how um, how well it would do. Right. And of course, if you have a little area, even like a little porch or balcony, uh, 
would it be okay someone asks to put mm. the herbs out on would that mm. even be preferable perhaps oh yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, I, absolutely you know what i will say is you know with that basil if you can grow your basil during basil season which is when it's warmest outside harvest that basil you know grind it up in a little olive oil put it in the freezer and then you got basil in the winter yeah. you don't need to grow it so you know grow things when they like to grow yeah thank you the uh, next question has to do with the tool which was a very helpful suggestion you gave for mm -hmm. protecting um fruit trees or specimens from squirrels or animal attacks of any kind raccoons mm -hmm. are big here in san francisco yeah so the question is does the tool reduce the likelihood of trapping small birds i've had that happen with bird netting yeah oh absolutely i mean i i use bird netting for years and i just hated it you know because it destroys your finger it gets caught on the tree the birds get caught in it and then you can't reuse it so you have to throw it in the landfill and that was what led me to send out a message to the master gardeners saying you know what do people use and like half a dozen people got back to me and said tool mm -hmm. and i've never looked back since then so, so tool if you if you get it it's it's much smaller holes than um than the um the bird netting stuff and um birds will not get caught in at all now there was uh one thing i forgot to mention with both tool and agrabon you may be looking at that and thinking well does it block the sunlight from getting to the plant and the answer is no not much so like 90 to 95 percent of the sunlight is going to go through the the tool or the agrabon and water will go through them both as well okay very good to know and tool as you mentioned is available in most fabric Correct. stores it, yes. it's i believe it's spelled t-u-l-l-e and have you had success getting it at one particular fabric store or? So as master gardeners, we're not allowed to make <laughs> yeah, right. commercial recommendations. <laughs> I just get online and, and get online and search for it. And you will find fabric stores that sell it. Um, I mean, you could run down to the corner fabric store and buy it, but depending on how much you need, like I buy these just bolts. I don't know. They're like, you know, 50 yard bolts. Um, both the Agrabon and the tool come in like 10 foot widths, and then you can get them in like 50 yard lengths or something like that. Okay. Um, Wonderful. And besides trees, are there any other applications, any plants or shrubs that you put it over to or... Well, as I said, this year, so for two years in a row, my pole bean crop had failed. And I just felt that something was munching away on my beans, but it wasn't clear what it was. And so this year, I took that raised bed where all my beans were, and I put eight foot stakes in the corners. And I wrapped the tool all the way around it. I fastened it down at the at the base and kind of flipped it up over the top of the stakes. So it was almost, you know, completely enclosed. It was it was open at the very top. And um and I had a great bean crop. So whatever was getting to my beans, birds, rats, whatever, didn't get to my beans. Um, now, of course, you know, people are saying, well, how do you harvest the beans? Well, I had it fastened in certain places. So I would just unfasten it and open it up and go in and do my harvesting and then refasten it. And I did the same thing around my tomatoes. I have about 
10 tomatoes in large containers outside of my raised beds. And I did the same thing. I just took steaks and I wrapped the whole thing in tulle. And um, I had much less shrinkage this year than I've had in the past. I was just trying to envision your tall beans wrapped in this tool like anybody looking overhead or over the fence because of the nature of the fabric it would look like a wedding party in your garden well, <laughs> people come into my yard and like everything's wrapped in tool because i got a lot of fruit trees and i don't know if if anyone remembers the artist christo who used to wrap things yes yeah it right. looks like a giant christo installation yeah. it's a little bit weird but <laughs> you know, I'm willing to make the sacrifice in order to har actually harvest stuff. Okay. So it, it does the trick for sure. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, another question we have here is any tips for the Western cherry fruit fly? It's kind of an abbreviated question, but obviously this is some kind of, I know you talked about IPM. Um, and you gave the website for where people could look up what they have. Yeah, I would, I would, I'm not familiar with that. And I would, I would, you know, suggest that you go to the IPM website. Look and it look up. That up. Now. Yeah. On the master know, right. It, okay. So yeah. I, I did a little, I'm curious where that question is coming from. And here's why. It's from, uh, I don't know, Karen, Karen is still online, but Karen, if you'd like to put in the chat. Uh, I'm just curious yeah. where Karen is growing Western cherries. Yeah. Where, where is growing cherries? Petaluma. Okay. Petaluma. That, that, yes. So you yeah. can grow cherries in Petaluma. Yeah. You can't really <laughs> grow cherries in San Francisco. Here's the thing about fruit, growing fruit trees. Most fruit requires a certain number of what we call chill hours during the winter, um, which are um, number of hours below um, 55 degrees, okay? And th they need that for the um, fruit to set properly the next spring. and there's a whole wide range of um, the number of chill hours required for different types of fruit trees, apples, pears, cherries, peaches, nectarines, um, et cetera. And in San Francisco, you basically don't get enough chill hours to grow like just about any of those um, of, of those fruit crops, okay? Um, even here where I am in Menlo Park, I, I tend to grow things that are fairly low on the, the chill hours spectrum. Um, but then when you get farther afield from our, our, te our temperate summers, certainly up in Napa, Sonoma, down into, um, you know, the, the Garden of Heart's Delight, the old Santa Clara Valley, there you, you know, it's fruit tree paradise down there. Um, so yeah, Petaluma is just fine for cherries. I'm just not familiar with the Western cherry fruit fly. Right. Um, and then we have a comment from a master gardener, Virginia, uh, who mentions that Pam Pierce has an updated version of her book that actually just came out this year on Golden Gate Bar Gardening. So it's the same title, but it's an updated version. So thank you, Virginia, for putting that in the chat. And uh, Claire. Yeah, and, and, you know, just putting in a plug for Golden Gate Gardening. If you're a serious gardener in San Francisco, you should have that book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Pam was the first one who broke down San Francisco into its own microclimates, you know, like 12 different microclimates. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And she really goes into a lot of depth about what you can grow where and when in Mm -hmm. in the city, because it's just so unique up there. Right. And we also already posted um, all the the helpline information at the Botanical Garden. Um, Now, if there are no more questions, I have, and I'm not seeing any, but we have five minutes for anyone who wants to get their question into the chat. And there's no such thing as a wrong or an incorrect question. So now's your opportunity with Jonathan. So in the meantime, my question has to do, Jonathan, with my sun gold tomatoes. So I've grown sun gold tomatoes. I live in Noe Valley, which is a warmer area Mm -hmm. in San Francisco. I have a south-facing exposure. And I've grown them in on my patio in like 15 gallon black plastic pots successfully Mm -hmm. for the past. Oh gosh. I've been a master gardener for nine years. So for nine years this year, for the first time, they did not do well in the same location, same Mm -hmm. soil. And they ended up with, I think this is probably what you were referring to some kind of wilt Mm. But their leaves turn kind of brownish and curly, and the yeah. harvest production is really low. Yeah. And um, and I had them on a drip for like five minutes, three times a week. Did I give them too much water? No. So doesn't sound like too much water okay. um, to me. I mean, I'm I'm doing drip three times a week mm-hmm. here. Um, so. You know, so first of all, um, there's so many diseases that affect tomatoes. There are blights and wilts. And it, I mean, if you go on the IPM site, it's just, you know, it's a wonder anyone grows tomatoes, right? Um, the, the the key thing towards discovering if you've got a wilt is if you if you still got those tomato plants in the ground, um cut open the stem okay if the stem is turning sort of tan colored where the xylem and phloem okay. um flow through the stem if those are turning sort of tan colored then you've got a wilt which means you're not going to be able to grow tomatoes in that spot anymore okay um now that's not saying you definitely have a wilt i'm just saying that's how you would find out if you do if you have a blight that's i think an airborne disease and so you you don't have a soil problem okay um some other things to think about um you know we had a really really cool and wet spring And a lot of us, our tomatoes were just going nowhere um, for the spring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's possible your your sun goal is just never established that well because of that. Um, So and, and, you know, sun golds are they're pretty reliable and pretty hardy. Um, So. Yeah, I would I would look at one of those two things, and of course, the worst being if it, if it were some sort of a of a wilt, and that would prevent you from growing in that spot again. I'll tell you that you know over the years, and it's partly due to increased shade in my yard, but partly due to soil stuff. All my tomatoes have migrated into containers. Um, because that way I can control the soil and, you know, you don't need to replace that every year, but every two years or so I'll swap out the soil and that's going to reduce your likelihood of getting a a wilt on your tomatoes. All right. Thank you so much for that answer. We have another two questions here that just came in. Uh, We're worried about our lead paint in our area. Any advice about checking the soil or preventing roots from reaching through raised beds? 
Okay, so when you say preventing roots from reaching through raised beds, I'm assuming what you're talking about is nearby trees, roots infiltrating into your raised beds. And I can tell you from personal experience, there is absolutely nothing you can do about that. Um, as far as lead is concerned, if you're concerned about it, the only thing to do is to get a, a, a comprehensive soil test from a certified lab. And I believe we have a list on the master on the San Francisco San Mateo County Master Gardeners website. We have a list of certified labs, and that'll cost you like two hundred dollars. Um, but if you're concerned about lead or other metals, then you'll probably want to spend that money just to make sure. Okay, thank you for that. And for those that have joined late um, in the chat, the librarian has said that you'll be getting a copy of this presentation with all the links uh, that were previously in the rolling chat. So no worries there. Uh, here's another question. Does compost have a shelf life? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I wouldn't, I don't see why you would want to leave it on the shelf, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, you know, if you have it, just put it out there. Mm -hmm. You know, e either work it into the top few inches or put it on top of the soil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's if you've got your, your you know, I'm assuming that maybe you have a supply of homegrown compost. If, you know, you're like most of the rest of us, you're going out and purchasing compost, in which case you're only going to buy in as much as you need. Okay. So if you have more homegrown than you can use in your garden itself or your area that you're composting, um, would you recommend that people maybe give it away to a neighbor or just get it out there and use it? I'd give it to the neighbors and become really popular. Okay. <laughs> All right. And here's another one. What do you do with discarded soil from your tomato pots? Yeah. Does the soil go back into your garden? So when you say garden, um, I think you can put it somewhere in your yard. I would not put it into your raised bed um, mm -hmm. because of the possibility that there might be some, you know, soil-borne diseases in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I just, I, w I wouldn't put it somewhere you were planning to grow vegetables again. Right. But like, could it go in a flower garden or? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But just don't recycle it into your vegetable plot or yes. area. Okay. Yes. So I think that is it. That is it for our questions today. I wanted to give you um, a little bit of feedback we got from some uh, participants that this was, Jonathan, a very helpful presentation definitely learned new things today and um, you inspired me to try planting again so oh, good. nice words uh from from uh, a participant and we thank you and again we thank the library for fall vegetable gardening and it's not too late to get out there right and never to clean late. up your garden and whether you decide to plant fall or winter crops, like Jonathan said, we're on the cusp. You've got time and the days are, well, when this, the smoke clears completely, the days ahead should be, except for our little storm coming in, should be relatively good. So I wish everybody happy planting. And Ramon, I see you're back on from the San Francisco Public Library. Do you have any closing remarks? Yes, I would like to thank um, the Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Aridi, for this presentation. Um, I was also going to mention those great comments that I'm seeing in the chat. And um, I would like to thank all of the people who've joined us uh, today and look for uh, 
survey that I will be sending out. Um, I will be sharing that with you as well, Jonathan and Aridi, and um, where we get a lot of the, the nice comments that I'm seeing here in the chat. So thank you very much. I'll be sending out the PDF of the presentation. Um, I will be sending out those links and also um, the uh, some of the the newsletter. That's what I was going to mention. So please sign up for the newsletter for uh, the Master Gardeners for their for their future programs and for the Business Science and Technologies newsletter. Uh, that's where we um, put those programs out there, uh, like the one today. So thank you very much again, uh, everyone, and thank you, uh, Jonathan and Aridi. Um, today's program has has ended. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>